Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed for our May Q&A session. Thanks to everyone who has submitted questions for us, either via our YouTube community page or via our Discord community, which is exclusive to Patreon and Floatplay members. Lots of great questions to get to, as always. Can't un answer all of them, unfortunately, but yeah, I've chosen a couple of the heavily upvoted ones and a couple of other good ones. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. First question, is there any technological reason Microsoft can't make an improved version of ClearType that works better with different subpixel arrays? If they just aren't doing it, how hard would it be for monitor makers to create their own drivers? So yeah, this is a great question, and obviously it comes about because of the new OLED monitors that are sort of dominating the discussion at the moment and their use of non-standard subpixel arrays. So what we see from most LCDs that have kind of been the, the standard to use with computers for quite some time, they all use, or the majority of them use, an RGB stripe, which leads to normal text rendering because the subpixel processing that we see for text expects that RGB layout. Whereas with these new OLED monitors, we're getting more interesting layouts, things like triangle RGB that we see with Samsung's QD OLED panels. And we've also got RWGB with LG's W OLED panels. I think I've got that right. Yeah, RWBG, I think, not even RWGB, which is kind of an, kind of an interesting one. But anyway, it's a non-standard array. So as I've mentioned before, when we are using subpixel text rendering, they're doing subpixel level processing on those you know bits of text to make them look clearer. And if you've got a non-standard subpixel array, you're not using RGB stripe, the text is going to look a little less clear than is normally expected. And yeah, the reason why they've, you know, come up with this sort of processing technique was really to enhance the quality of text on low resolution display. So back in the day before we had 4K monitors that can really render text nicely, this was a really key way and a really good way of improving the smoothness of text on those sort of low resolution displays. So Microsoft ClearType was always the way that Windows had implemented this sort of subpixel processing, for text at least. And if you're familiar with the utility in Windows, you can go through and you can choose different you know, methods of processing. The unfortunate thing about ClearType, at least with the way Windows 11 works, and certainly the more modern versions of Windows, is that ClearType, it isn't very useful. In fact, it's kind of been, I don't know, not really superseded, but there are a lot of applications that ignore ClearType completely. They either use their own text processing algorithms, or they just don't see any need to use ClearType. So the use cases for ClearType are quite limited. There's certainly, it will benefit things like the Windows operating system. So if you're looking at Windows Explorer as an example, then ClearType will have a benefit. But even some of the newer Microsoft applications, like even just the settings page, tends not to be impacted by changing ClearType settings. Web browsers, Microsoft uh, Edge, Chrome, Firefox, I believe Opera as well, they all use their own text rendering algorithms these days and completely ignore clear type. And this is something that I discovered when I was messing around with the Alienware AW3423DW and using utilities like MacType to try and adjust the text rendering of these monitors. You can actually quite clearly see when changing clear type settings that there is no impact in applications like Google Chrome, um, which is kind of annoying because it means that if they if Microsoft were to implement these sort of OLED fixes addressing triangle RGB and LG's W OLED panels, it may not actually have that much of an impact for people using things like web browsers. It may not have an impact for things like games, which often don't even bother with things like ClearType because they're using their own font rendering system in the game engine and so on. So yeah, it'd be nice to have an option that allows us to adjust subpixel rendering for those monitors, but it may not actually have that much of an impact. And we may be at the stage where we have to ask all sorts of application makers to be implementing these changes, like going to Google and being like, hey, you use your own text rendering system. We can sort of override this at times, depending on what we do, but because of the newer text rendering systems, you know, can you please fix OLED for us? We can't use ClearType for this. Or is there a new system that can be implemented in the operating system that sort of then overrides the override in applications? It's it's becoming very complicated with these things. You know, maybe there, there could be a driver fix or something like that. But when we're talking about, you know, injecting changes into applications, it, it becomes very complicated. And yeah, one of the things, as I mentioned in that uh, Alienware, rev uh, not review, but analysis of text rendering was, yeah, that 
even utilities like MacType, which are designed to go in and try and force font changes across many applications, that even that doesn't work very well. And that doesn't work very well even when you do some of the more extreme adjustments, things like changing the registry file, things like that, where you think, hey, surely this is gonna make an impact. And yeah, it just doesn't work in a large number of applications. So that's currently where we're at with text rendering at the moment, which is unfortunate and disappointing. I think something that may work to a greater degree is maybe what we see on the Mac side of things is in Mac OS, things like rendering the you know productivity applications at a much higher resolution and then scaling them back down. So for example, if you had a you know a 1440p display, you may instead render that at 5K. So you'd use like a 200% scale factor and then you'd then downscale that back down to the, the native resolution of that display. Potentially, does that improve text rendering? That that could be a way to go, but at least the, the current way of doing things, yeah, it isn't very effective and I don't think it will be effective going forward now that all sorts of companies are sort of, you know, with the applications overriding uh, the sort of clear type utility. It has been around for a long time, so it's not surprising that, you know, there's been newer techniques and newer systems developed to sort of deal with text rendering. It was a very old sort of system. So yeah, that's currently where we're at, I think, with, with text rendering. Are monitors using the same panel able to use a different screen coding, or is screen coding an inherent part of the panel that can't be changed? It definitely can be changed. You know, the panel, you know, LCD and OLEDs are made up of multiple different layers. There's not just like one single layer that does everything. You know, at least with LCDs, you've typically got the front panel, then you've got things like polarizing layers and polarizing filters. You've got the actual LCD crystal layer itself. You've got back planes. You've got the back light as well. So LCDs and OLEDs, you know, OLEDs have fewer layers, but they also still do have a, a layered construction. You know, there, there's many different sort of layers, as I said, that go into making a panel. And one of those layers is going to be the screen coding. So theoretically, it would be possible to just you know, change out that outer layer from something that's matte to something that's glossy. That's typically where we see the biggest differences in sort of the the layer, the matte versus glossy that people talk about. Things like QD OLEDs are a little different because some of the other layers are impacting what we see there in terms of reflectivity. Things like polarizer versus non-polarizer and things like that do affect there. But if we're talking matte versus glossy, it should be possible for that outer layer to be changed. What makes it complicated here is that most panel manufacturers ship their panels or sell their panels in sort of a combination. So oftentimes you'll be not only getting the LCD layer, but you'll also be getting the outer layer as well as the backlight. Some manufacturers will ship the backlight or sell the backlight separately. So you'll get only the LCD layer and then it'll be up to the display manufacturer themselves to you know source a backlight for that particular panel. So it really does depend on the company that we're talking about, whether it's like LG versus Samsung versus BOE versus AU Optronics, they all have different methods of, of working with those sorts of things. So some manufacturers will you know, ship multiple versions of panels where one will have that glossy outer, one will have the matte outer. Again, it just really depends on the manufacturer at hand. I know some people have done this sort of custom job where they rip out the outer layer of their monitor and re replace it, taking it from matte to glossy or whichever way they want to do. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that, but certainly because they are layered construction, it, it's theoretically possible to do that. So yeah, again, it should be possible to change these sort of things. It does depend on the manufacturer um, and yeah, that's where it lies. Lately, all the higher end monitor recommendations have been for OLED screens, but I have a gaming and productivity mixed use case, which would be at high risk of burn-in. Aside from upgrading to the Samsung Neo GX range, are there any good ultra wide or large format options or are the LG and Predator 38 inch screens still as good as it gets? See, so yeah, unfortunately, I think if you're talking about you know, HDR gaming, if that's why you're considering things like OLED or the Samsung Neo range, there's not a ton of great ultra wide or large format options that don't use OLED. You know, we do see some 43 inch um, panels that have had varying HDR capabilities. I've tested a few of those and I've never been super impressed with them. A lot of the 38 inch screens as well aren't really HDR capable. They might have some limited edge lit local dimming, but you, there's very few of those options that use full array local dimming. I believe there, there might be some new, like maybe 48 inch or 43 inch LCD mini LED TVs, 
Um, but as I don't really cover TVs too much, I'm not super up to speed with what those options might be. But that, I guess we could put that in the potential basket. But certainly there are other options that maybe you'd be considering for those sorts of gaming and productivity use cases. Of course, the, the Neo G8 and well, specifically the Neo G7 are quite good monitors, but we've seen more um, IPS LCD options coming out as well that use full array local dimming. They may be of interest to you because they're flat. They use IPS technology. So you know, you're not going to have to deal with some of the issues with some of those Samsung panels. They're not going to be curved, which is always nice. Um, things like the Acer Predator X32 FP is a monitor that I think our friends over at TFT Central have recently reviewed that uses 576 zone, um, you know, full array local dimming to 4K display as well. So, you know, there are those options coming more to the market. I would expect, again, as the year goes on, we're going to see more of those 32 inch 4K sort of mini LED products. Um, but yeah, sort of the larger and more unique formats like 38 inch ultra wide, the sort of 42 inch sizes. You know, because they're sold in lower volumes, there's not as much panel development that goes on there, unfortunately. So yeah, hopefully that sort of answers your question and maybe in the future we'll see more of those options. I personally quite like the 38 inch ultra wide format because it's sort of that slightly higher resolution. It's a bit larger. I think it, it's quite nice and I'd like to see a few more, you know, panels like maybe OLEDs developed there, maybe a few more mini LED options. But yeah, that's kind of where it's at. Probably a quick question here to answer. Can a single large monitor ever really replace the functionality of multiple smaller ones? I mean, I guess with this is like theoretically, yes, right? Like you'd have the same sort of resolution. Like let's say you're using one of those super ultra wide panels that can have like two 1440p monitors side by side or whatever. You know, theoretically that single panel could replace the two other panels. The only thing I'd be considering with this one is sort of like how does the operating system handle, you know, snapping applications with one monitor versus multiple monitors. I've always found that, you know, things like Windows handle multiple monitors better than snapping to different points within a single monitor. For example, if I wanted to have three displays, it's very easy to snap apps, you know, one app on one screen then the middle screen, then the right screen, having three apps across the three monitors, whereas it's much more difficult, at least in Windows, to sort of snap something in the middle, the left and the right of the display. So that's sort of the consideration I'd be thinking about one large screen versus multiple smaller monitors. At least with the way those operating systems work today, I'd probably still prefer the multiple smaller monitors for productivity work. Um, but maybe those things can be changed in the future. Like, can we get more advanced snapping? I know there's utilities out there that can you know, change the way those window management tools function in Windows. So there's certainly different capabilities there. But yeah, personally, I'd prefer the multiple smaller monitors. Previously, you have mentioned that running your monitor brighter will affect pixel response times due to the increased panel temperature. Are there any other aspects of performance that brightness affects, such as ghosting slash overshoot? So I guess with this question, yeah, it is definitely true, as I've mentioned before, that pixel response times are affected by panel temperature and you know, brightness can affect temperature. But when it comes to ghosting and overshoot, those are both quite closely related to the pixel response times. Ghosting, for example, is typically an artifact produced by slow pixel response times. So the longer and longer it takes to transition from one color to another color, the more likely you are to see you know, artifacts because it may take longer than a single refresh to occur, or maybe you're tracking something in motion and it's taking a really long time to change. So you're gonna see those ugly ghosting trails. And overshoot's kind of on the opposite side of things. When a monitor transitions really, really fast, it may overshoot the target that it's aiming for, which causes that inverse ghosting artifact, those sort of brighter trails behind the behind moving objects and things like that. So when we're talking about pixel response times, ghosting overshoot very closely linked to that. And what we see with panel temperature and brightness affecting those things, as I've mentioned before, the warmer a panel is run, which again, the brighter a panel is may make it run warmer, that tends to make monitor uh, pixel response times faster. So the hotter the monitor runs, the warmer it is, the more likely you're gonna get inverse ghosting and overshoot because it's gonna run faster and faster. And as we know, eventually it gets faster and faster and then it starts to overshoot a little bit and then overshoot more and overshoot heaps as we get warmer and warmer. So that's typically what how overshoot might be affected by temperature. And then the other way around, the colder you, you go, so let's say you're running it at like 10 degrees ambient or you're a winter in a colder country, you're gonna to start to see those response times take longer and longer, which might mean that you'll see more and more ghosting on the display. 
So yeah, it's all very closely linked in terms of those artifacts, and they're all linked to that sort of pixel response behavior, which is temperature dependent. As for other you know, artifacts and, and issues brought up by temperature, haven't really seen too many of them. You know, things like color temperature and color accuracy might be affected slightly, but it's not something that I've really seen to the degree that we see with, with the pixel response side of things. You know, it may affect the longevity of the panel as well. You know, running things warmer tends to cause degradation faster. But again, you know, it's probably not something that you'd be concerned about on a daily basis. So yeah, really it is the sort of pixel response times being linked to temperature, which is going to affect things like ghosting and overshoot. All right, next question. For older models and secondhand monitors, what would be a fair price as an example for a given spec? Are there any old monitors that hold up well compared to newer releases? So yeah, you know, it's interesting this question because I've spent a lot of time looking at the used GPU market for some of my videos over on Hardware Unbox, but I haven't spent a whole ton of time looking at the used monitor market. You know, usually my starting point with all sort of used monitor discussions or used market discussions is to look at where's pricing for new things now. Like for example, let's say you wanted to buy 1440p 144 hertz, where, where are we looking at for good quality new monitors now? And typically what we'd see is like $250 is sort of the entry level. It could go up to like $400 for a high quality monitor, but typically we're looking between $250 and $400 for that sort of product, which then means if you're looking on the used market, you want to sort of line up, you know, what what are we getting for that price? Like at $250, is that where the used monitors are starting or are they $200? And you don't want to be getting into a situation where you know a monitor that five years ago cost $600 is only being priced at $400 now on the used market. You really want that used price to be aligning to what the capabilities of the market are today. So you know there's been some very high quality 1440p, 144Hz-ish monitors from prior years, things like, I believe it was like the PG279Q from ASUS and those sort of highly popular monitors. LG27 GL850 is another one that was popular, you know, about, when was that released? 2019, so a couple of years ago now. You know, those were $500, $600 monitors when they were released, but these days that sort of performance, you can probably get that for around the sort of $300 mark, which means for a used product, that's sort of, that's your starting point. If you can get it new for $300, then what are we looking at used? Do you want a 20% discount? Do you want a 30% discount based on the fact that it's used? I think something around there would sort of be be appropriate, in which case then you're looking at what, like 200 to $250 for that sort of product. So that's my th thought process always when thinking about the used market. You need to be very in tune with the new market and making sure you're not just sort of, you know, some people often put in their listing, hey, this was like $600 you are new. I, I spent $800 on this a few years ago. That really shouldn't be a consideration. It should all be about the capabilities of today. The other question you have to weigh up with monitors is that, you know, these are heavily used products. So, you know, often backlights do have a limited time that they can be used for before they fail. So if you're buying a monitor that's five years old, that's been used for thousands upon thousands of hours, you know, that backlight may only be rated for 8,000, 10,000 hours before, you know, it starts to fail. So if you're buying a monitor that's already well into that lifespan, you're buying something that's four or five years old, there is that potential that you may only be getting a couple of years of use out of it before some of the components start to fail. Um, you know, it's kind of unlike things like, you know, GPUs and those sort of things where I think those tend to be capable of being used for a lot longer. You know, displays, you know, it is common for things like backlights to fail, power supplies to start failing and those sorts of things. Now, I'm not saying this happens all the time. You can certainly get monitors that last for 10, 15 years, no problems. It's just something to be aware of when you are buying on the used market. And I think things like ratings, longevity tests will be really interesting to see, at least on the TV side of things, you know, how how long does like an LCD backlight typically last for? That is hopefully going to be answered by their testing over there. So yeah, those are all the sort of things that I'd be considering. I certainly think there are products that would very much be competitive in today's market. As I said, things like a 27 GL850 used would still be a great monitor to be buying today. The, the performance of that product is very much in line with sort of the mid to entry level products that we see from 1440p today. So very much still reason to buy that sort of thing. It just, you need to weigh up the pricing and make sure you're not getting, yeah, as I said, ripped off by used sellers. So yeah, that's my thoughts on the used market, I guess. Is monitor overclocking worthwhile? What are the potential problems you may face with an OCD monitor? So I guess there's kind of two ways to answer this question. If we're talking about monitor overclocking, as in it comes with that sort of factory OC option that we see from some monitors where 
you go into the OSD settings, you'll see there's like an option between running it at say 165 hertz and 180 hertz. You just flick a setting, it overclocks the monitor, and then you go about your daily business. Definitely would recommend using those features. I personally have never really had an issue using the factory OC options that come with monitors. They tend to be designed to do that. Um, I guess they don't, you know, make that the default refresh rate just in case, you know, the, there's maybe one or two percent of monitors that can't quite hit that refresh. So, you know, they're trying to sell more monitors to you basically. But based on what I've seen, it's very rare that those uh, those features cause issues. When we're talking about other types of overclocking, like using, you know, the custom resolution utility or the driver utilities to increase refresh rates. You know, this isn't, you know, it's like all sorts of overclocking. It, it depends on your sort of tolerance for issues and failures. And by that, I mean, you know, you can get a lot of flickering issues and stability issues with overclocking a display beyond what it's rated for. You may only end up getting a few hertz out of it. It might be the difference between like 165 and 172 hertz, which to me doesn't make, you know, a significant enough difference. And if that is introducing the potential for things like flickering, stability issues, it may have bring about issues with you know, free sync ranges, G-sync ranges, where the adaptive sync functionality doesn't work as well. You know, to me, it, it's not something that I'm super interested in doing. I prefer my monitor to be stable and not cut to black randomly. And you, know, you never really know when that could happen either. You could be running your desktop apps just fine with no issues, and then suddenly you're running a really intense game or you're running a video file that just happens to trigger something. It uses the maximum bandwidth of the connection or something, and then suddenly things stop working. So for me, at least, it's not something I'm super interested in messing around with. I know previously, especially with older monitors, that they tended to have been at least some range that you could get out of overclocking monitors, specifically like 60 hertz monitors. You could often you know, do a significant amount of overclocking on them. But yeah, these days, I wouldn't expect the benefits to be um, too significant. You know, people have often talked as well about like, is this going to make the monitor fail earlier? I would imagine that it would impact longevity. But the question is like, are we talking about a monitor dying after 14 years instead of 15 years? Or are we talking about like three years versus four years? And obviously one of those is a lot more important than the other. Um, so again, you know, if you're really concerned about longevity, probably something to avoid, but I don't think it'll impact it that much. But again, you know, it's not something I've done a ton of research into to sort of say, hey, you know, overclocking reduces the lifespan of your monitor by 20%. Yeah, I, I'm just speculating now. I don't actually know the, the sort of answer to that. So yeah, for me, I, I'd probably just not really dabble too much with overclocking. If it has that factory OC option in the OST settings, definitely enable that. But beyond that, messing around with things in the driver settings and so on, is something I probably wouldn't recommend. Okay, next question. This one comes up a fair bit, so it's probably worth making a dedicated video about this one, um, but I'll go through it very quickly because I think there were a couple of heavily upvoted questions about this. Could you please explain the difference between the various color spaces, i.e. sRGB or Adobe RGB, Rec 2020, etc.? What are their advantages and disadvantages, and what typical use case might you use one color space over another? E.g., would you ever use anything other than sRGB in gaming, and if so, when? And if you're doing general productivity work, which doesn't require highly accurate or extended color spaces, such as Excel spreadsheets, MS Office apps, and so on, which color spaces should you use and why? Okay, so color spaces come about because monitors cannot display every single color that exists on the color spectrum. So when you look at our reviews and you see those kind of triangular, triangular shaped color charts that sort of have this curve in them, um, you know, the, the overall curve that you see, the big wide gamut, that is all of the colors. So when you look at that chart and you see that sort of curve that goes round with the straight edge on one side, though that is meant to represent all of the colors that theoretically could exist in the electromagnetic spectrum. With monitors, the way that they work in terms of, you know, their red, green, and blue subpixels, generally speaking, and, and other factors, you know, they can't show all those colors accurately because, you know, maybe we'd need to have 30 subpixel monitors or something to be able to do that. But currently with the three subpixels, they have to limit the color space to sort of a, this triangular shape that we're very commonly seeing um, with monitors. So that's why color spaces exist. And I think that's a good starting point for this discussion is that, you know, you might think, well, why can't they just show all the colors? Why do we need color spaces? It's because, again, monitors can't show every single color. So beyond that point, we start talking about things like the standards that have been made to show colors. And 
the reason why that we have these color space standards as is is so that people who are both designing content and people who are viewing content can get the same experience. You want to ensure that if you're, say, encoding a video, that you're encoding it with color space information so that the display can then go, oh, you know, that was designed for sRGB, so the maximum value color value encoded in that data is the sRGB maximum value. My screen's also sRGB, so I'm going to map that correctly. Um, so that, that's kind of where we see these things come about. And over time, color gamuts have become wider and wider. Color spaces have been designed to be wider and wider because you know display capabilities have gotten better over time. Originally, when we were talking about things like sRGB, you know, there were monitors that couldn't even do 100% sRGB. And you know, even today, you see some laptop screens, low-end screens, which may only have like 60 to 70% sRGB coverage. But anyway, that, that's sort of a side tangent to, to all this and explains kind of why we have these different standards. So at the very basic level, sRGB is the most important color space for PC desktop use for most of the time. This comes from a number of factors. Firstly, it's the default color space in Windows, and this is really important because it being the default color space means that that's what the majority of applications running in the SDR mode in Windows are going to expect the display is producing. So they're going, hey, they're telling the monitor, hey, this is what the colors we're using are. And the monitor then has to respond and say, okay, we're going to operate in that way. So SIGB, very, very important for your desktop productivity apps, desktop apps, Windows interface. And it's also very similar in its overall colors to the Rec. 709 color space, which is used for the majority of SDR videos. So if we're talking you know, movies encoded in on DVDs and things like that, even Blu-rays, um, if we're talking about YouTube videos, they use Rec. 709, which is very similar to sRGB in its color space. So the most important one is sRGB, and that's you know that's why we see a lot of wide gamut monitors oversaturating colors because Windows defaults to sRGB, and then those colors get expanded up to a wider gamut because there's that sort of disconnect between what the monitor is doing and what what the color space is. So sRGB Rec. 709 very important for SDR content, the majority of SDR content, and sRGB is the default in Windows for SDR use, which is why it's very important. When we start talking about wider color gamuts, there are obviously a number of these that depend on different sort of use cases. Adobe RGB was designed for photo processing work. So we're talking about Photoshop and print applications where you know, cameras can often capture colors beyond what displays at the time could do. And you might be printing them on high quality printers that again can you know, show more colors than a display can do. Adobe RGB was really designed for that. So it's more green biased because, you know, I guess maybe they were thinking photos at the time would show greens more. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I haven't really looked into that too much. But Adobe RGB is for print work, photo work, and that can be useful if you are a professional working in those sorts of areas. Whereas DCI-P3 is kind of the alternate to Adobe RGB, if you want to think of it that way. That's designed more for video work. So the best way I tend to think of it is your sRGB for your desktop app usage and the default in Windows. You've got Adobe RGB, which is for your photo processing work, your print work, and then you've got DCI-P3 and the other P3 sort of gamuts, which are designed for video work. So if we're talking about wide gamut videos and we're talking about cinema standards, often that will be encoded in DCI-P3 because that's what cinema projectors use. And it's tends to be more towards what where we're going with HDR type things because HDR you know is primarily designed as a a video standard so when we're talking about P3 video playback work and then we get to Rec 2020 which is wider than all of these gamuts Rec 2020 is the standard used for HDR and it really tries to encompass as many colors as maybe theoretically as possible on these sort of 3 sub pixel um, array monitors and yeah so Rec 2020 is used for HDR standards, but it's not really super possible to produce Rec 2020, or at least 100% Rec 2020 colors with modern display technologies. I think some projectors can get pretty close to Rec 2020, but I believe the majority of you know, LCDs, OLEDs, and so forth don't really hit full Rec 2020. But yeah, the thinking there was, let's make the color gamut super wide for the future of HDR. You know, We're allowing monitors to get super bright now, allowing the displays to do all this crazy stuff, get super dim, super bright. Let's also make sure the color gamut is super wide so that we can grow into it with future technologies. So yeah, that's sort of the basic explanation of those sort of things. So again, to simplify things, 
sRGB, the default for SDR content use, and is the most suitable for desktop apps. Adobe RGB for photo work, DCI-P3 for video work, both of those being wide gamuts, and then Rec 2020 for HDR. You know, it doesn't matter too much about color space if you're just planning on using Excel, which I think was in your example there. It doesn't matter too much for gaming, especially SDR gaming, which most of the time that will, again, be sort of expecting the, the sRGB Rec 709 type stuff. However, for HDR gaming, you are going to be wanting to think about color gamut, things like how much of Rec 2020 does it cover, because games are sort of moving towards utilizing more colors, more of the Rec 2020 side of things. So yeah, again, it's probably worth a, a, a video going through and really detailing all that stuff more in depth, um, but that's kind of where we're at with color spaces at the moment and the sort of basics that I think you need to know. For the higher end, would it be better to go for a 1440p 240Hz OLED monitor, or would it be better to go for a mini LED 4K 165Hz Plus monitor? To simplify a bit, is OLED worth it to go 1440p, or is mini LED good enough to justify going 4K? Performance on either resolution is not an issue. Yeah, interesting question. I imagine a lot of people are going to be tossing this one up, especially as we don't have 4K OLED monitors at a reasonable screen size at the moment, certainly not 27 or 32 inches. Personally, I guess it really depends on your use case. I think for gaming, um, there's not really that much of a difference between gaming at 1440p and 4K on sort of your 27 and 32 inch screen sizes. You know, a 4K panel will look better. It will look a bit sharper uh, and a bit clearer for games, but it, you know, it's not a significant difference. If we're talking about really big screens like 42 inches, I definitely wouldn't want that to be 1440p. I think 4K does have a notable advantage there. But gaming, you know, especially with, you know, TAA upscaling techniques these days, things that tend to, you know, not necessarily deliver the, the clearest and sharpest texture quality. Again, very unlikely that you'll see major differences between 1440p and 4K while gaming. But at least in my experience, it does have a significant impact for things like text rendering and text quality, image quality for Let's say you've taken a really high resolution photo and you want to display that on your screen. 4K will show that photo at a higher resolution. It will look crisper and sharper. Text will look better. So, you know, if you sort of have that mixed workload where some of the time you're gaming, but some of the time you're video editing or you're working with spreadsheets or you're coding, things that are very text heavy, you're doing a lot of web browsing, that's where I could see 4K being an advantage for you. 4K also gives you that greater range of scaling options um, you know, because it has more screen, you know, doesn't necessarily have more screen real estate because that's more related to the size of the panel, but it has more pixel real estate. So you can kind of mess around with scaling to that sort of exact size that you're after. You can potentially show more on the screen by using a, a lower scaling resolution. So then you sort of, you know, things are going to look smaller, but you can fit more stuff in. You know, those are all advantages that you get with those 4K monitors. So I think it, you might be missing out with the sort of productivity angle going with the OLED panel, especially because OLEDs do have reduced um, text rendering quality, even just versus a 1440p LCD. So with that sort of double whammy of effects, then then yeah, certainly 4K is something to consider if you are using it for productivity apps. But again, for gaming, if that, if that was your sort of consideration, do I go... I want an HDR screen for gaming. Do I go OLED at 1440p, IPS, VA, LCD at 4K? I don't think it makes that much of a difference. And I know in the question you say performance isn't an issue, but certainly 1440p is easier to run from a GPU perspective and you may end up getting quite a good experience there. So yeah, that's sort of my thoughts there. Final question, in monitors with fake HDR like the M28U, would HDR on still look better or would it be better to just leave it off? This is a really difficult question to answer um, because at least based on my experience testing a wide variety of monitors, this is highly dependent on the monitor. There are some fake HDR products that really put zero effort into their HDR mode and will look terrible for things like the Windows desktop, for things like games they will be blown out, washed out. You know, they could have look really bright for no reason, look really dim for no reason, have terrible colors, crushed colors, crushed blacks. There's all sorts of issues I've seen with those sort of fake HDR monitors and there's very little consistency between them because you know, as I've mentioned, it's kind of they're only in including the HDR feature really to as a marketing point to put on their spec page, to put on their feature list saying this supports HDR. They're not 
really concerned with people using it because they know that hardware capabilities aren't there. There are some monitors that do a better job of this than others. There are some that, you know, the HDR mode does look reasonably good, um, even if, you know, the hardware capabilities aren't there. But, you know, again, it, there's a lot of things to toss up here because, you know, for some monitors, it, it may not produce that much of a difference between SDR and HDR viewing. And this is kind of my main criticism of those products is that if you're not really getting an experience that's dramatically better than the SDR experience on that product, then it's not really HDR. You're not really getting that much. However, things like HDR do change the gamma curve of the content. You know, SDR content that's using sRGB or Rec. 709, it tends to use a different gamma curve than the, you know, the PQ EOTF that we see for HDR content, and that can change what the content looks like. So if you've got a monitor that, yeah, it doesn't have the HDR capabilities, it's a fake HDR product, but it doesn't have those sort of weird processing issues because you know they have genuinely put in time to make the HDR mode look good, then potentially you may prefer the way that the HDR EOTF curve looks compared to the SDR gamma curve. And that may be sort of a personal preference thing where you turn on HDR, you're like, hey, yeah, you know, I prefer the sort of greater emphasis on darks that you get, the sort of shadow content and shadow quality that we get from you know, the HDR mode versus the SDR mode. Even if I'm not getting bright highlights and, and dark shadows on screen at the same time, maybe that doesn't look great, but I prefer the way that the HDR content looks. Or I prefer having, you know, the wide gamut capabilities, the color increased color gamut versus SDR, but I'm not as concerned about the brightness and contrast side of things. So, you know, there are reasons to use the HDR mode on those products, but it is very, very product dependent. There are some that look good, there are some that don't. And generally speaking, I think, yeah, if I wouldn't want you to sort of turn on the HDR mode and go, oh, that's HDR and be disappointed with the experience. So yeah, again, it's sort of something that you have to sort of play on a case by case basis. And then on top of that, there may be some games where the HDR mode on a non HDR monitor is, you know, not really usable. I might be thinking of games that are sort of more geared towards dark shadow quality, things like, you know, playing Dead Space or Resident Evil as an example, where a lot of that is sort of nighttime, lots of shadow quality, shadow detail. The game may be unplayable in the HDR mode on those monitors because it's so dark and you know, you're not getting the detail that you should be getting. Whereas other games, you know, I think of maybe a brighter game, something like maybe Forza, a game that's mostly set during the day. Maybe that's going to look great on your HDR monitor that doesn't have actual HDR hardware capabilities. So those are all the sorts of things that I'd be sort of considering with this. Uh, certainly worth experimenting with. There are good good quality products that, as I said, have reasonable HDR modes even without HDR hardware. So yeah, play that one case by case, I think. All right, and that does it for the May Q&A session here on Monitors Unbox. Thanks to everyone that did submit questions for this one. Really enjoy answering these questions and seeing what you guys are thinking and the sort of things that you, you know, want to know from us here at Monitors Unbox. I think as I said, that color space question is probably a great one that I will eventually get around to making a more in-depth video on, sort of fully explaining what those things mean and not just leaving it to a, a short question and answer session here. But yeah, that's that'll do. Thanks everyone for watching this video. If you do want to support us here at Monitors Unboxed and Harbor Unboxed, then consider our Patreon and Float Plan accounts. Links to those are in the description below. We do have our sort of private Q&A. Um, question answering box in our Discord community there. So you get sort of that exclusive opportunity to answer questions or have questions answered in these videos. And we have a bunch of other stuff as well. BTS videos, monthly live streams, all sorts of good stuff. So thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.